Hey guys, and welcome back. Today we'll be taking a deeper look at the AMRO electronic load that I purchased with the hopes of using for my battery capacity testing. This video will assume you've already watched the first part where we took a look at the features and specifications of the device, how it works, and what was inside. If you haven't watched that video yet, I strongly recommend you go and watch that first before taking a look at this video. This video will focus more on the programming and coding I've done to gather statistics from the device, how I'm gathering those statistics, where I'm storing them, and how I am generating charge graphs and so forth uh, to facilitate the capacity testing. I'll then run a full capacity test of the uh, lie time battery behind me here as an example of how we're going to use this going forward. Prior to having this electronic load, I've been using a battery and BMS in a shunt block to measure the amount of power discharged from a battery for my capacity test. And that's measured and reported in amp hours. And I was doing it that way because I already had the hardware and it was a very easy way to get capacity testing statistics on a device that was network capable that I could then write code against to pull those statistics into a database. There are other shunt blocks out there that would work a lot better for this sort of thing. You know, Victron shunt blocks are wonderful but there's really no easy way to get that into a computer, get that into a network and log that data in real time, especially when, for example, the Victron shuts off. Once the battery completes, the Victron shuts off and loses the data. And I've been looking at a way to do this better. Particularly, I wanna find a way to get a constant current discharge rate. I've been looking at some specialty devices to do this. Western, is it Western Mountain Radio or West Mountain Radio? Has some very good capacity testers out there. I've seen other people use them. They're recommended for capacity testing. The capacity tester I would need to get to test the batteries the way I want to test them runs around four grand. And I don't really have four grand to spend on battery testing. So I thought this would be a good alternative. I paid right around 800 bucks for this electronic load on eBay. And I think it's going to work great. So as I mentioned in the first video, it does have network capabilities. I've got it plugged into the network. Uh, so we're going to start here by switching to the computer and taking a look at some of the command protocols. Then we'll take a look at the database layout and the code I've written. I would recommend watching this video in 720p at least due to the resolution of the computer. 1080 would be optimal, but if you're watching it like on a phone or something else, um, you're probably not going to be able to see the code, the text, or so forth. All right, first things first is the user manual for this device has a very detailed document uh, showing the command line protocol. So for this, I'm looking at the Amrel Eload Operations Manual document. It covers the PLA series air-cooled and the PLW series water-cooled electronic loads. Uh, so scrolling all the way down to page 87 here, we can see the remote programming instructions. We're gonna focus specifically on the ethernet version, which is using the SCPI or Skippy protocol. Uh, so here we can see a fairly complex example of a command. Uh, the semicolon denotes there's multiple statements together. All we wanna do is run a single command. And for that, an example is going to be volt colon lev 10. Voltage, a sub command. And then if there's any parameters with that, this example is a 10. So all of the syntactical information is explained here. And uh, I'm, I'm not gonna go through this, this diagram. I'm just gonna give you some example commands. But like I said, everything is laid out here exactly. The command, the shortened version, how you use it, what it does, what it returns, the units. Uh, so we're just gonna jump straight over to a telnet prompt. All right, so we'll just do a basic telnet to 192.168.10.5 is the address I've given it. And it's running this service on port 3000. And I found that by doing an Nmap scan of the address because I couldn't find that documented anywhere, but um, an Nmap scan did reveal the ports that were open. It is port 3000. So the two primary bits of information I need to calculate and run a capacity test are the current voltage and the current current. So to do that, we're gonna use the measure command and it's a multiple part command. We need to tell it what we are measuring. So we're gonna put a colon and I want to measure voltage. And then I'm gonna put a question mark. So whenever you run a command that you're expecting a result to come back that you're querying, you put a question mark to indicate that that statement is a query. So we have measure colon voltage question mark. Press enter and you can see it responds with okay and it sends back 13.5947 volts. The same with the current, there's measure colon current. Now I made a mistake there if you saw, I typed in C-U-R-E and then I hit backspace and typed in R. Now it's not gonna know that I typed a backspace so it's gonna say this is an error and I'm gonna have to retype it. Measure colon current question mark. Now that we spelled it correctly, we get back the value of 0.064 amps. So there's nothing running at the moment and that's just what it says when it's idle. But I need to be querying this quickly to get this voltage and amperage information out of the device so I can be calculating an accurate capacity and graphing the voltage over time. Now to do this, I chose Node.js and Node.js is an asynchronous language. That means it's not waiting for responses to come back when you run a command. 
So you can run measure voltage and then immediately run measure current afterwards and they might come back at different times. One might take longer. I don't want the measure voltage command to be waiting because measuring current has not returned if that makes sense. I don't want them processing sequentially. I want them processing together at the same time as quick as possible. Now my goal is to query this every one second. So every second I want a statistical reporting of the voltage and the current coming back. Before we get into the node script, let's take a look at how we're storing that data. So I'm using MySQL as the backend database. It's actually MariaDB, MySQL, MariaDB, they're pretty much the same thing. One's owned by Oracle, one's not. So there you go. Uh, so I've got two tables. One is the data log table and that stores the timestamp in seconds. It's a Unix epoch time, timestamp in seconds. We have the timestamp in microseconds. So that's 1000 times the timestamp in seconds. We have what the item is. It can either be amperage or voltage. So amps or volts. And then we have the value. Again, it comes back in four decimal point precision there. Pretty much every second here, we should have at least one amperage or voltage reading. The second table is just a very basic parameters table. So the details table, we have the timestamp of the start of the test. We have the timestamp of the end of the test. We have the voltage at the start and we have the voltage at the end of the test. So I'm going to assume you're familiar with Node.js or at least basic programming and SQL. There's not enough time in the video to explain, to explain programming and teach a programming language. So we're gonna make the assumption you're already familiar with it. Uh, so basically I'm initiating two Telnet connections. One connection is going to be used for the voltage measuring and one's going to be used for the current measuring. And the reason why I'm doing it that way, because again, this is asynchronous. So I could send a measure voltage and a measure current over the same connection at the same time because it's not waiting for a response. But the reason why I'm doing two connections is because as you can see in this example, when you do measure current, it returns a decimal. When you run measure voltage, it returns a decimal. It doesn't give you a unit for this response. So you don't know if this 13.59 coming back is an answer to the voltage query or the amperage query, right? So by keeping the query separate in two separate Telnet sessions, we know that in session one, it's always going to be the voltage and in session two, it's always going to be the amperage coming back. So then I have my uh, database connection string here. You can see my very secure password. It's actually a connection pool and I'm limiting it to a maximum of five connections. Uh, the connection pooling works a lot better in Node.js than a single connection would. So all the way down here, we have our uh, connection initiation. So there's connection one and connection two. And then this is the core of the program is a function that says send data. So when this function's called on connection one, we're writing out measure voltage on connection two, we're writing out measure current. And then we're setting a 1000 millisecond timer uh, or one second for when this is gonna run again. So now that I'm reading this, I think I misspoke. We're actually taking that timestamp in milliseconds, not in microseconds. We need to capture that response that comes back. So there's an event handler for the data received. And uh, this is the event handler for the voltage. So we're gathering the time from the date.now function. Uh, we need to do a bit of cleanup here because as you saw in the example, it sends back two okays and three line breaks per return value. We don't care about that. All we want is the numerical value that comes back. We're outputting it to the council for troubleshooting and then we're simply inserting it into that data log table. Again, we capture what it is, it's the voltage. We capture the time in milliseconds. We then divide that by 1000 to get the time in seconds and then we capture the actual data value. Now the data handler for the current's a little bit more complex because in order to, to know when the test has started, stopped, gather the starting voltage and the stopping voltage, uh, we're going to do that all in the current handler command. So it's basically the same, gather the time, strip the okays and the line breaks. So we're going to print that value to the console and we're going to insert it to the database the same way, this time using the amperage type instead of the voltage type, straightforward. Now to gather the start and stop time and voltage, I have a Boolean variable called test running. By default, test running is false. So the first time we see a current come back that is greater than one amp and the test is not running, we'll know that means that the test has started. So as soon as we notice the test has started, uh, we're going to capture the test start time in seconds. We're also going to capture the start voltage. And to do that, I am selecting the maximum voltage from the data log table, current time up to 10 seconds prior. So there's a 10 second buffer in there to grab the voltage before the test actually started. So the next is when the test has stopped. So now we say if the test is running, so if the test running is true and we received a current less than one, we know the test has stopped. The current has stopped, that means the test has ended. We update the stop time the same way in the details table. And then we capture the voltage at the end of the test. Uh, we're doing three seconds before the test ended and one second after the test ended just to get a little bit of a buffer in there. And we're adding where the voltage is greater than five because I don't want it to mistakenly grab one or zero or one of those numbers to come back. Sometimes when the BMS shuts off, there's a little bit of residual voltage there from capacitors or from you know leaking through the transistors, whatever it may be. 
and then we're setting a timer to terminate the program. We're going to let it gather data for five more seconds and then it's just going to do a basic exit and we're done. And uh, hopefully that makes sense and it's not too much uh, programming overload. This, this works very well. I've done a lot of testing on this already. So now all of that data is in our database. That's great. How do we report on it? So I came up with this query for calculating the capacity. So this first statement is selecting all the data points for the amperage and it's numbering it sequentially. And we have a second select doing the exact same thing that is then left joined to the first. And we're left joining that on row number equals row number minus one. So that's taking the current row and it's joining it to the prior row so we can tell what has changed between those two record sets. So if we take the second row as an example and we subtract the timestamp from the first row, so the row prior or the last read event, we have an elapsed duration of 1,410 milliseconds. So we know the amperage that was read at that timestamp. So with that amperage, we can calculate that 0.021559255 amp hours were drained in that 1.41 seconds of time. I'm doing, these, I'm doing these calculations to 10 digits of precision. If we continue that process over and over again for the entire duration of the test, we end up with this long series of read events, the amount of milliseconds that's elapsed between each read event, and the amount of amp hours has elapsed in each read event. Uh, we can sum it all up, and we can round it to four decimal places, and we get the final capacity of our battery, which in this example was 103.58 amp hours. It's a lot of information to take in. I hope that makes sense. So when I start a battery test, the first thing I do is I truncate that data log table. It's old data, we don't need it anymore. And I update the uh, details information, the start stop time and the start stop voltage. So we're clearing all those out. There's now no history left. So I can switch on over to my PuTTY terminal here where I'm running this Node.js script and I can just do node index.jsp. So now we can see it's running through that one second timer and requesting the voltage and amperage at every step. So we can see an output here. And if we go back to our data log table here, we can see all of that data is now logged in our data log table. Uh, so if you can see this battery behind me here, it's just the light time battery. Uh, it's on the Ames charger right now. We're gonna go ahead and shut off that Ames charger. It is fully charged and we'll disconnect it. So this is going to show us a graph of the voltage and amperage over time. We have the test date, the duration. For some reason, people always ask me, how long did that test take? And well, you know, it's fairly easy to figure out how long the battery will last, but we're gonna start reporting the duration as well. We have the reported capacity, starting voltage, ending voltage, and the average amount of current throughout the test. So I can control that e-load through the telnet prompt as well. Uh, we're going to set the constant current mode that's done with the command mode CC. Okay, and you see it says okay. And I'm gonna do a 50 amp discharge test which should take approximately two hours on a 100 amp hour battery. Uh, we're going to use the current command and set it for 50 amps. So now we're ready to begin the test and that's done using the command input on. Now, when I run this command, if you watch over here on the Node.js script, you should see where it detects the test has started. Input on, and here it says testing has started. Now it's reporting 50 amps. I can also open up my little graph here, refresh this. So we're starting to see a slight discharge curve here. So far the test is run for 35 seconds and we've discharged 0.48 amp hours. Again, the starting voltage was 13.5977 and it's an average of 50.0534 amps. This is very, very precise. Uh, so we'll let this run and see what the resulting capacity is and then we'll be back to take a look at the final graph. So here's our new Grafana dashboard and as I said, it looks very similar to the way it did before. We have our battery voltage, our discharge current, our discharge power in watts. We have the measured discharge capacity and we have the test duration now. Now one advantage over the Baytrium is that this is updating very quickly. This is updating these numbers every second. So it's much easier to watch and we're not standing here waiting saying, okay, this capacity only comes back once every 30 seconds. So let's wait and see if it changes down to the second. So this is going to be much better going forward for these capacity tests. Now, if you take a close look, there is one thing missing on this testing setup yet. And I still do not have the voltage sense leads for the four wire setup. This does support a four wire setup with a second set of leads for measuring the voltage to avoid the voltage drop over the cable. Um, I did order a nice set of alligator clips with some silicone insulated wiring. I just haven't received them yet, but that's okay because this is just a testing setup for demonstrative purposes. And we will certainly have those ready for the first real test. The test has concluded. We came in at 103 amp hours and it took two hours, three minutes and 33 seconds. And taking a look at our computer again here, we can see where it detected the test has finished. Uh, once the current dropped to 0 0.08 or otherwise shut off, uh, that's the point at which the BMS disconnected. 
and we can see the voltage immediately before that event occurred was 9.2869 volts. Uh, we then continued to sample data for five more seconds and then exited. And we can see the completed graph and the completed test report for this battery. Uh, so the test took two hours, three minutes, and 33 seconds. The capacity was 103.0904 amp hours. We started at 13.59 volts and we ended at 9.28 volts. And the average discharge current throughout the test was 50.06 amps. And here we can see our voltage discharge profile. Uh, very, very cool. This is, this is very exciting. So I think this will work very well, especially for 12 and 24 volt batteries. It'll work great for 48 volt batteries as well, but at uh, 800 watts, I'm only gonna be able to put 15 or 16 amps or so. Uh, it won't be a perfect 0.2 C rate test. This brings us to the end of the video, and uh, I'll be honest, I didn't expect it to go on for so long, but I didn't wanna really cut too many of those details out. Hopefully you didn't find it too boring. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please leave those down below. Hit that like button before you go, and if you stayed with me this long, thanks for watching.